ever been on a beach written your name on the sand meet castles or forts with wet sand only to see them get washed away did you feel sad have you ever scribbled somebody's name someone you love on a rock on a tree trunk on your school bench then you would love this poem where edmund spencer in his 75th sonnet tells us what happened when he tried to do exactly something like that in Perhaps you have already watched our videos on sonnets, uh, on Renaissance poetry. But even if you haven't, after this video, you will have a very clear idea about this poem, about Spencer, the way he wrote, and this whole idea of love poem during the Renaissance. Now, many of you already know that a sonnet is a 14-line poem which has a specific rhyme scheme. Now, when a poet writes a series of sonnets on any theme or on any occasion, it's called a sonnet cycle. Edmund Spencer, he was a very, very gifted poet. He wrote this very famous sonnet sequence which is called Amoretti. The word amour in French means love. And he wrote this for his beloved Elizabeth Boyle, who he got married to. And this sequence of sonnets, this series of sonnets or sonnet cycle, was published in 1595. There were 89 sonnets in them. And the sonnet which we are going to look at today is the 75th one or sonnet number 75. He wrote this cycle during the Renaissance and poets in England were undergoing a series of phases in which they experimented with different kinds of poetic forms and they tried to do something very innovative. So before going into discussion on different aspects of the poem, I want you to look at the poem itself. It's a very beautiful short love poem and I'm sure you're going to like it. The poem begins like this. One day I wrote her name upon the strand. Now, suppose you don't know anything about Spencer. You don't know anything about what a sonnet is. Still, you can make out certain meanings from these lines. So let's first look at those simple meanings. One day I wrote her name. So there is a speaker here possibly the poet himself and we will understand later that this poem is highly autobiographical and we can actually say that Spencer is talking about himself when he says I. One day, so any random day, I wrote her name. Her is of course the beloved, the person he loves. One day I wrote her name upon the strand. Now what is a strand? Strand is a seashore, a sea beach. So it's a place where the sea meets the land. So both of them, they were standing on this beautiful seashore and he scribbled her name on the sand. It's a very natural gesture. We all do that when we go to the beach, don't we? But then something sad happened. But came the waves and washed it away. Of course, if you write things where the sea waves come and touch it, it will simply wash it away. Again, I wrote it with a second hand. I don't know why he did that because if it's washed the first time, it will be washed every time. But he still tried to probably convince his beloved that uh, no matter what happens, he will go on trying to put her name there. So he wrote it again. Second hand means second time using another writing. So he wrote her name again on the sand and we know what happened but came the tide and made my pains his prey so he was taking the trouble to write her name i wouldn't actually call that pain uh, but he uses this word probably because it alliterates with the next word prey so he is saying that the tide is like a hunter and the sea comes like a hunter, 
the tide of the sea or the waves of the sea and they attack the name which he has written on the sand and that name becomes like a prey p r e y it means something people or hunters hunt on so the name becomes a victim to the waves and the name is actually wiped away so we can see here the tide is personified and he is using the pronoun his instead of saying its so this is the occasion of the poem this poet or this speaker is trying desperately to imprint the name of the beloved on the sea beach but he is not able uh, to do it because of the waves vain man said she so here even in this short poem we have a dialogue so she that is the mistress or the lady love she says that he is a vain man and then she says vain man said she that does in vain assay a mortal thing so to immortalize now if you are uh, in your first or second semesters of english honors uh, you might feel scared by this kind of construction these words and you might feel that i don't understand a word but the expression is basically very simple vain here is used in double sense first she says he is a vain man here vain means somebody who is very proud uh, who is full of himself okay so he is trying to write her name on the sea beach and he is going on doing that as if he wants to challenge the forces of nature so he is too proud he thinks that he has the power to even work against nature so she calls him a vain man and then she says that dust in vain dust here means it's an archaic way it's an old fashioned way of d o e s does that does in vain assay assay here is the verb of the sentence so you are trying to do something in vain here in the second usage vain means something which is without any success something which is futile a failure so you are trying to write my name down and you can see it's can going to get washed away every time so of course your attempt your essay essay means attempt your essay is fruitless your essay is vain so first meaning of vain is proud and the second meaning of vain is fruitless futile useless so you are trying to immortalize a mortal thing what is he trying to do is trying to immortalize something you know the meaning of mortal mortal means anything which is going to die eventually man is mortal so his girlfriend is definitely mortal but he is trying to prove to the world that i am writing the name of my beloved as if i'm trying to turn her into somebody who will never die her name will never vanish so i'm trying to immortalize her i'm trying to make her not mortal or in other words i'm going to make her name permanent eternal all right and that is not going to work because he is working against nature this is his mistress or his lady loves reply and she says for i myself shall like to this decay and eke my name be wiped out likewise eke here means also so just like the name which is getting wiped away by the waves i am going to also be wiped away from this world the moment i die so no matter what you do i am not going to be immortal because i am a human being so this woman is definitely very realistic and she tries to tell him that i am going to die so what's the point of writing my name on the sand and interestingly she uses a word eke eek which now means also 
and this word has also been wiped away so uh, jokes apart hearing this the poet says not so code i code i means i say code is an archaic form of the word coat not so code i let baser things devise to die in dust but you shall live by fame whatever is ordinary in this world whatever is not valuable will die in dust now this is very important because in the bible it says that we have all come from dust and to dust we will return uh, similar ideas are scattered through all religious scriptures throughout the world but here he says that baser things common things will die in dust but you will live forever he is saying about his beloved and why does he say that my verse your virtues rare shall eternize my verse my poetry now you have to rearrange this line to make this line sound more familiar to your ears let's rearrange the words if you read it like this my verse shall eternize your virtues rare or your rare virtues then that makes sense right so in spencer uh, there's a lot of inversion grammatical inversions which you have to rearrange so that it makes some sense to you if you are a newbie and he says my poetry my verse my verse means my poetry will eternize eternize means will make permanent what will my poetry make permanent your rare virtues your special qualities so he's trying to praise his beloved saying that she has very rare qualities but isn't he praising his poetry more that your qualities are rare but my poetry is powerful okay and in the heavens write your glorious name so he is not going to just write her name on this sand he is going to make her immortal even in the heavens where when as death shall all the world subdue our love shall live and later life renew so when everybody will die in this great big world we will still be alive because of our love now it's a very common sentiment in lovers especially when they are so much in love and he wrote this when he was about to get married to this woman and uh, it said that he used to write one sonnet every day so we can understand the urgency about time in him and here this whole idea of waves coming in washing away the name it actually is metaphorically connected to the idea of time okay so the ocean of time is your life and the waves come and take away everything that's the whole idea here and he says that even when everybody is dead we will still be alive because of my poetry so this is the general meaning now we will study this poem uh, from a more technical standpoint first let's look at the rhyme scheme of the poem because that is the spine of a sonnet unlike poems which are written in free verse or longer poems a sonnet is a very structured poem and if you have already seen the video you know about different kinds of english sonnets and the various categories of sonneteers if you haven't watched that video yet then the link will be given in the description box and the i button is well it's somewhere up there uh, i can't make the direction yet okay so go and watch that video after you complete this because that is very crucial to understand not just this sonnet but the other sonnets by other sonneteers which you might have in your syllabus all right come back to this let's look at the rhyme scheme how is a rhyme scheme of a poem determined let's find out first line ends with the word strand so we name it a the second line ends with away does it rhyme with strand no it's different so we name it b then come to the third line it's hand does it rhyme with the first line or second line 
of course the first line what was the name of first line a so we name this third line as a so if you break this whole thing up like this you will find that the rhyme scheme is a b a b b c b c c d c d e e so it's a very compact rhyme scheme where the first four lines they are kind of getting into the next four lines and then those four lines are getting inside the next four lines and eventually you have two single units or they are called couplets rhyming couplets which give a kind of a closure to the poem so this poem basically follows the pattern of both petrarchan sonnets and shakespearean sonnets now i'll just give you a very cursory idea about the two petrarch was the person who first popularized the form of the sonnet he was italian and english poets they borrowed the form from italy so they started with the idea of petrarchan rhyme scheme what petrarch did he used to write sonnets by breaking them up into two parts the first eight lines they were called octet and they used to give one idea and the next six lines used to give the opposite idea it was like he was proposing something and then in the next six lines he was saying the opposite thing all right and when this sestet begins it begins with a turn which is called volta it's like i'm saying something and then i'm using expressions like but not on the other hand that kind of a turning effect is seen and another perspective is brought in now let's look at this poem to find out whether it fits the petrarchan sonnet style or not now when you look at the uh, poem you would find that the first eight lines are about his problems when he's trying to immortalize his lady love's name by writing the name on the strand and the way uh, his uh, beloved reacts to it so that is one episode in the next six lines which begins with something like not so that means whatever she is saying is not right she says that he cannot immortalize her in the next six lines he says yes he can and he shows how so the first eight lines deal with something and the next six lines deal with something else as a reaction to it or as a uh, you can say an, an opposite viewpoint is given so you have a, a kind of an octet sestet division or octave sestet division and we also have the volta or not so which turns the whole argument so you have that turning or a volta but does it fit the petrarchan bill completely no not in rhyme scheme if you look at the structure you will also be able to understand that this poem is not just about 8 plus 6 division it is also about 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 2 how in the first four lines he is saying what is does in the next four lines he the reaction of the woman and in the next four lines his reply to her and the final two lines give a kind of a definitive closure so this idea of last two hanging lines you can see this is the rhyming couplet this is found only in case of english sonneteers and not in petrarchan sonnets in general now there might be a little bit of an exception now and then but this is the normal tendency that we find this uh, rhyming couplet specially in case of shakespeare sonnets but spencer wrote before shakespeare so we can say uh, he popularized the rhyming couplet which eventually uh, became such a hallmark for shakespearean sonnets and somehow i feel that english people english poets they love to you know kind of give a kind of a closure to a poem say something definite conclusive rather than be like dilly dallying like the italians they don't do that much of the time so they are very direct and uh, very fond of conclusions so we have this rhyming couplet idea 
in case of english sonnets so if you ask me what kind of a sonnet is it is it a petrarchan sonnet or is it a shakespearean sonnet it's neither it's a combination of the two uh, basically spencer wrote what we now know as spencerian sonnet so he created this whole idea of this blend and his rhyme scheme is so very more compact it's very difficult to write a spencerian sonnet so in this sonnet and in his other sonnets he does show off his poetic skills and spencer was he is called the poet's poet uh, that means some poets write for common people where common people can understand them or can really appreciate the entire beauty and then there are poets who write for the poets and they are called poets poet uh, milton was a poets poet spencer was a poets poet so when you look at this poem again uh, with a more critical approach you can identify these tendencies he uses a lot of alliteration uh, in the second line itself you have waves and washed uh, and this this grows and by the time you reach the end of the poem you simply see an outburst of alliteration as if his confidence is growing so much that she can't hold it in and look at the last line or the second last line first where when as death shall all the world subdue so you have alliteration of w alliteration is when uh, two or more words begin with the same consonant sound in a line which has an impact on the listener and in last line look at it our love shall live and later life renew four times he is repeating l trying to show off his poetic skills and the best way to uh, judge his poetic merit is to see how much he is sticking to his meter meter is the way a poem is rhythmically structured when you read a poem it has not just rhyme often poems don't have rhyme but they always have meter they have a kind of a pattern through which you read them so when you read this poem and you want to play a drum with it you play it like this one day i wrote a name upon the strand so you see you hit the drum five times so this is pentameter and since you hit the drum on the second beat that is one day i wrote a name it is called iambic if you already have prosody in your syllabus you will understand what i'm trying to say if you don't have that let me just give you one uh, idea that iambic pentameter is a very very crucial meter uh, whenever love poetry is involved and renaissance sonneteers love to um, experiment with iambic pentameter a lot here also we see he makes this poem uh, a classic example of iambic pentameter and that gives the poem a kind of a flow that love poetry demands also look at the way the line the fifth line starts vain man said she here the beat comes in the first word itself so here he is breaking the pattern it's called a spondee where we give beat on both words and this is kind of you know it has a jarring effect as if uh, he was in a dream like state and suddenly uh, the beloved you know jerks him out of his dream and says this is reality you can't immortalize me and she says vain man as if she is scolding him so this is the way he plays with these words and everything again look at this beautiful uh, expression baser things devised to die in dust so much of d and d is a very hard consonant and it has a harsh tone to it doesn't have a soothing effect and he's talking about base things common things and the bad things that happen to them they simply get wiped away nobody remembers them and that is harsh reality and in a way it also includes the body of his beloved both of them know that he can immortalize only her name he cannot immortalize her body egyptians well they wanted to do very similar things but we end up having those horrid mummies and that's scary 
so he knows that all he can immortalize is his girlfriend's name and not her body not her real life and when he uses words like virtues verse they are soft consonants v and that has uh, an opposite effect it has a soothing effect on the mind therefore his attempt to immortalize her is a soothing counterpart of the harsh reality of death so all poets they understand that the idea of love the idea of soul is separate from the idea of body so her name here does not mean her whole existence it only means the name of elizabeth boyle so can we say that this poet is overconfident he is boasting like she said he is a vain man think again because we are reading his poem when he is long gone and who would have known about the name of elizabeth boyle if this poem was not there in your syllabus so in a way he was right wasn't he that he is going to write something which would be read down the lines and something very similar was said by shakespeare too actually this whole idea of uh, of comparing time with waves it's it's not something unique uh, in spencer and i would say shakespeare um derived a lot of images from spencer many poets did that there's nothing to blame uh, in there because he recreates something so beautiful and i really want you to look at these lines by shakespeare in his sonnet 60 he writes like as the waves make towards the pebbled shore so do our minutes hasten to their end so just like waves uh, draw near the shore our life is also uh, like that you know it moves like that and in the last two lines in the uh, rhyming couplet of that poem he says and yet to times in hope my verse shall stand praising thy worth despite his cruel hand so in spite of the cruel hand of time my verse my poetry which praises you will stay so shakespeare wrote exactly what spencer wrote but do we call him a thief we don't because this is recreation because well images are common images imagination is also common in a way but the way it is presented changes and shakespeare does that beautifully who is the speaker spencer at least the speaker is someone who understands the lasting value of poetry and now that we have mentioned shakespeare i really want to discuss my favorite sonnet by shakespeare in our next video go on guessing in the comments below and so far as this poem is concerned you should prepare questions like analyze uh, the elements of a sonnet with reference to one day i wrote her name another favorite question is analyze this poem as a love poem you might be tricked by questions like analyze the central symbols and images in the poem or write a critical appreciation of the poem all these things amount to the same thing you have to discuss about why this is a special kind of sonnet Uh, it's called a scottish sonnet or a spenserian sonnet spenserian sonnet and scottish sonnets they are same you have to tell about the rhyme scheme about the meter of the poem about the theme and how that is connected to the way in which he presents the symbols such as wave is equal to time and the act of writing name on the strand is equivalent to writing a poem and you should also mention that this is of course a poem of love but more than that it is about the power of poetry the power of poetic imagination or poetic creation and in a way it's an assertion that poetry can actually work against nature and create something and make it permanent even when the whole world succumbs to death now that's a tall claim because if everybody dies who would read his poems 
But then by everybody, he probably meant everybody who was living then. So they obviously have died, but his poetry is still alive. So till our next video, stay happy, stay subscribed. This is Monami Mukherjee signing off.